Hello and welcome to the Mathematics for Public Health Colloquium. I'm going to hand you over to our uh, one of our PIs, Professor Kumar Murthy, who is going to um, introduce the Mathematics for Public Health program and start the proceedings. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and we were just chatting before about whether we were supposed to say good morning or good afternoon. I, I think we say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. But in any case, welcome to the uh, to the seminar, the colloquium. Uh, many of you, I'm looking at the uh, people who are present, and I, I recognize many of you uh, as regular attendees at uh, Math for Public Health events. So you already know about this network. But for if in case there are people here who are new, let me just say that Math for Public Health is is one of five national networks uh, established by the Public Health Agency of Canada and NSERC. Um, to study emerging and infectious disease modeling. Um, the Math for Public Health group is uh, rooted in uh, the math institutes across the country, the Field Institute, the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, the Centre de Recherche Mathematique, uh, and the Atlantic Association for Research in Mathematical Sciences. We are a group of uh, more than 50 researchers across the country. Um, and our project has about a dozen or so uh, sub-project research teams that we have, we've been studying. Now, one thing that's come up as a common uh, uh, point of importance and interest in our network and in the other networks as well, is the attention that has to be paid to EDI aspects of mathematical modeling and, and public health in general. We already saw this uh, when we were looking at um, strategies for vaccine rollout. Uh, you remember earlier this year, many groups around the country were, were looking at what is the best way to roll out uh, the vaccines. And uh, in fact, it was uh, our speaker today, Sir Mr. Mr. who was uh, instrumental in our group in uh, pointing out the importance of uh, this EDI aspect and coming up with a strategy that had that significant impact. It was adopted by science table and then uh, later implemented by the province. So uh, EDI is a, is a very important part um, in the general public health uh, conversation. And it's probably going to get even more important going forward. So we're really delighted that we've uh, uh, been able uh, through the initiative of uh, John Hong and uh, Sarah Nayani, we've, we've uh, been able to line up a few talks on uh, specifically on EDI issues and, and make sure we address it in the, um, in the project. So that's the overall introduction to both Maths for Public Health and the uh, EDI initiative in that. Um, welcome again to everybody and I'll pass it back uh, to Sarah. Thank you, Kumar. So I was just going to give a, a overview of how we're approaching it. So we're going to have two sessions um, this month. We got the first one opening with Sharmista, and then we'll have another one next week with Professor um, Nathaniel Osgood, who is a University of Saskatchewan professor, and his experience uh, includes a range of infectious diseases modeling, but also working with northern indigenous communities. And he'll be drawing on that experience in the session next week. Now, the idea for the Mathematics for Public Health program is to gain a collective understanding of the impact and ramification of our modeling, how it can be used to um, it can hide uh, marginalized groups, but it can also shed unwanted light on those groups in a way that doesn't support them, um, particularly when it comes to infectious diseases. So we want to look at how our results can best be shared so that they can have, um, as, Char as uh, Dr. Mishra put in her title, that they do no harm. And, and the best that we can do is help become advocates and supporters of marginalized groups. Um, in the winter, we're planning to have a larger session. This will be a panel discussion, and our intent is to develop a framework that we can then use to apply to our research and to make sure that the knowledge that we create uh, it is done so in a, in, a, in a sympathetic and uplifting way um, and can do, you know, that we can do the best job we can to, to um, shed light on the important issues that we're looking at in this area. Um, I'm now going to pass you on to uh, Professor Wu, who will introduce Sharmista's uh, work. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Kuma. Um, again, thank you for joining us, all of you. Um, the Network Mathematics for Public Health uh, not only has a strong interest in uh, trying to take a leadership role in 
the consideration and uh, incorporation of EDI issues into our modeling activities. But I think we also have the, uh, the strong leadership from our members. The today's speaker, uh, Shamisa Akmisha, is a fine example of our expertise and leadership in the area. Um, Shamisa uh, Dr. Mishra is a Canada Research Chair in Mathematical Modeling and Program Science. She is a mathematical epidemiologist uh, with St. Mike Hospital and University of Toronto. Her lab is a global leader to really understand the impact of the transmission heterogeneity and to understand the inequality and the, the heterogeneous uh, sharing of the burdens of the disease. And uh, she is a really a leader speaking about mathematical models should be relevant, impactful, but not to him. And uh, that's, I understand is today's talk, but it's also her really leadership and a strong voice in the Ontario science table and the general science community. With this, uh, Dr. Uh, Misra. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. And, um, and I'll begin. Um, so uh, thank you very much for having me um, for this discussion. And um, what I'm going to try to do is go over um, some terminology, some assumptions, um, and interpretation of epidemic models in the context of the communities most affected. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Our research is funded by CIHR and CERC NIH and St. Michael's Hospital Foundation for Research Innovation Council. So I'd like to begin with the perspective that I'm coming with um, for this presentation and discussion. I'm a South Asian immigrant settler living and working on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wet'enad people, and which is now home to many diverse First Nations and Nui and Métis. I live and work on land covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So as mentioned, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, mathematical modeler, and an infectious disease physician. And the discussion today, um, however, draws on the work of experts and colleagues and partners across interdisciplinary dis expertise and community expertise, including community-led research, public health ethics, implementation and program science, particular social determinants of health, social justice, social epidemiology and stigma research, anthropology, patient-centered care, and field epidemiology and outbreak management. So just um, um, acknowledging the work of giants in, in this field. I'd like to go over heterogeneity and what it means in the practice of public health very briefly, but then really focus in on what this means for public health practice and public health messaging and, and our role in that. Um, landing on stigmatizing interpretation and terminology, including some anecdotes from um, our experience over this last two years. Um, and then some considerations for discussion when moving forward meaningfully. The list of suggested readings, um, which are shared through the slide, but I'm happy to share um, elsewhere. These are fundamental for some of the thinking that has helped me over the last uh, two years, um, but also um, a lot of prior work prior to that um, in, in the literature. So as we discuss um, um, over the next couple of slides, I'd like us to think about for whom did we design the public health response to COVID? So when we think about heterogeneity and particularly in the context of infectious disease epidemiology, we're thinking about heterogeneity along lines of exposure. So acquisition risk, relative population size, re reflective of, of um, disproportionate risks of, uh, um, of exposure, but also resilience. And then we think about onward transmission in the context of dispersion and networks. Again, in the context of both risks and resilience. And then finally, severity that can be both mediated through biological as well as, for example, comorbidities, age, but as well as access and barriers to services and systemic factors that lead to barriers. And these are, of course, intertwined and correlated in the context of often repeated exposures. And this framework of heterogeneity has been long applied in the context of HIV and other sexually transmitted infection epidemiology and mathematical modeling. 
governed and guided in particular by this framework of know your epidemic, know your response, wherein, was, wherein efforts are taken to try to understand the underlying transmission dynamics through a combination of modeling, but in particular, especially a lot of data analysis and including qualitative um, um, uh, studies as well, and particular social and medical anthropology. And the idea behind sort of know your epidemic, know your response is really around the intersection of those three layers of heterogeneity. So we've applied it for years, decades, in fact, now in the context of HIV and thinking about its application in the field of other infectious diseases. And what heterogeneity ultimately, while we model it often on the basis of either biological properties related to um, susceptibility, whether it be comorbidities or age, or we think about it in the context of contact networks um, or contact rates and contact networks, what we're really talking about are the result of heterogeneity is often prevention gaps, these unintended um, or these um, unintended impact when uh, that can undermine the impact of uh, um, broad scale strategies. So for example, when we've got even just a little bit of heterogeneity, so here is stylistic example shown with two, um, sub, uh, two populations or two networks that are intertwined. And so you've got the total population here, you've got one subset of the population, another subset of the population. We can think about this in the context of, for example, two interconnected networks. So we've got a base case scenario for the epidemic and what if a strategy, it doesn't work as well for one particular network. In this case, for, uh, we're highlighting an example of a neighborhood that experiences higher rates of transmission or higher risks versus if we design and assume a strategy will reach everyone equally. And so this idea that our interventions and our strategies actually reach and are effective for everyone, um, this assumption leads to a very different result than if uh, in reality that intervention actually doesn't work as well or reach or is able to be accessed by uh, a subset of the population. And the difference between equal reach and unequal reach um, leads to our prevention gap. And this prevention gap is most notable in the context of um, uh, um, uh, higher risks, but it translates and spills over across the entire population. And so this idea that an overall reduction can be achieved with broad scale interventions that actually are not designed for everybody will happen, but it will increase inequity over time in the absence of additional resources that are tailored to mechanisms that place networks and communities at higher risk. So again, just a stylistic example here shown with our base case scenario, the red cumulative infection curve for higher risk, blue with lower risk, and then what happens in terms of thinking about the cumulative incidence rate ratio, which can be a proxy or a measure of inequity when um, we have an intervention that does not reach a subset of the population equally. And here we've shown an example of higher risk neighborhoods or neighborhoods experiencing higher risks that can only reduce their contact rates by 10% compared to other neighborhoods where people have been able to reduce their contact rates by 25%. But importantly, even if there's equal reach of an intervention, if it does, if we don't actually address the underlying mechanisms that lead to higher rates of vulnerabilities to infection, to acquisition and or transmission, even equal reach may increase inequity over time. So what is an epidemiologist's favorite question thinking about heterogeneity? We're actually really interested in the sources of heterogeneity. So here's an example in the city of Toronto. Um, this is played out over the first and second waves 25% of the population accounted for 63% of the cases. And in fact, that's still what we're seeing now as we head into um, our current wave. Why is this? So then we can start looking at our epidemic curves by sources of heterogeneity. And now this doesn't necessarily reflect a source. It's just a proxy for what we think or measures of what we think might be going on mechanistically. And again, this draws on decades of work in other fields of infectious diseases where we've always stratified um, looking at epidemic curves by proxies or um, measures of what might be happening underneath that can tell us about what we might need to do that are tailored to these mechanisms. So here are epidemic curves 
shown by the proportion of the population working in essential services um, in, in Toronto. And when we take a look at these underlying social and structural factors, what I'd like to point out is thinking about within a city, the difference in epidemic curves here is shown by proportion of the popula population living in high density housing. The difference in epidemic curves within a city across these social and structural factors are as different as epidemic curves across provinces within a country. And here, highlighting important work conducted by the Wellesley Institute, where they looked at individual level data on self-identified race as a proxy for systemic racism, looking at the epidemic curves, again, within a province by proxies of systemic racism. Compare that to the, 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 the variability in the epidemic curves that we're seeing by provinces within a country. So this layer of heterogeneity exists reflecting the underlying social and structural determinants, even within the narrow um, confines of a city or a province. And importantly, what I showed with respect to Toronto wasn't just limited to Toronto. We did this analysis across 16 cities in Canada and within each city's overall approximately 50% of cases required in 25% of the population in the first and second waves. But the social and structural determinants of the spatial concentration actually varied between cities. So what we observed in Vancouver with concentration of cases disproportionately affecting neighborhoods with higher proportion essential workers, seen in, Vancouver, seen in Toronto was similar in Vancouver, but quite different in Montreal. So while we may see patterns of inequality in terms of the distribution of cases, the inequities that have led to that may be different across cities. And so landing on all of this was that when we think about heterogeneity, what we're really talking about in the context of COVID in particular, and has been shown with previous literature and previous respiratory viruses, including influenza, is that there are mechanistic social and structural determinants of um, a distribution and risks and of acquisition and transmission of the virus itself. And many of these determinants, they overlap. And this can lead to amplification of transmission, which is something that we try to capture in our models. Which leads us to the three principles in the practice of public health and how we are intertwined with this practice because of the work that we're doing. The first is equity. We do more for people in the context who may need more. The second is social justice, which argues that public health problems are primarily socially generated and can be predicted on the basis of and predicted based on the level of injustice and inequality in a society. And finally, participation, engaging with communities when designing interventions. And I think an example of this was really the hotspot vaccination strategy. The, implement, the resource allocation and implementation of that happened because of community-led and community-engaged and resourcing community-led efforts for hotspot vaccination. But taking these principles, one of the first things that um, I remember thinking it was back in November of 2020 was the following reflected in a study conducted by Ross um, Upshur and colleagues that work in public health ethics. So what they did is a qualitative study looking at the perceptions and the understanding and the um, conceptualization of equity and social justice among public health policymakers in Canada. And what they found was that people making decisions viewed health equity and social justice as distinct. It was considered that health equity was more clear, conceptualized as focusing attention on proximal disparities in access to services and materialistic determinants of health, and characterized therefore as, as neutral and comfortable. There was an ease of which it was, um, there was discussion around health equity. Where social justice was conceptualized as conceptualized as focusing on structural issues that lead to those inequities, it was characterized as political and uncomfortable. And the authors concluded that as a result, these uncomfortable justice-based considerations of power imbalances and systemic disadvantage can be issued in practice in favor of attending to proximal inequities. And these findings reveal the problematic ways in which considerations of justice and equity are and are not being taken up in public health policy, which in turn may, negative, may have negative implications for public health. And when I, I read this paper um, 
a few years ago, but it didn't dawn on me and I had to come back to it when just exactly about a year ago in November 2020, when first presenting some of the work that we have been doing around um, social and structural inequalities leading to inequities in the district, um, in the patterns that we were seeing for COVID-19, um, this was really reflected in those discussions. Um, and some of the feedback was that the health equity part was concrete, the social justice part, um, it was difficult. And so I, I remember thinking that it's not just probably public health policymakers. I think this uncomfortableness also exists within us as scientists. So one of the most important things that this pandemic has shown us is that our modeling provides these fundamental insights that have, that explain what might be going on, that give us direction in what to do. And these fundamental insights are critical. And often in order to do them well, we have to make simplifying assumptions, which hold true and are valid. But let's take a look at what can happen when what we have to do for parsimony in terms of simplifying assumptions are translated into public health programs in a world with inequalities. What they've done, and this happened historically even before COVID-19, is they've led to one size fits all programs. And I'd like to, at the end, discuss with, with um, everyone here that it's not necessarily that simple, clear models are not important, nor are they critical to providing fundamental insights, but it's really about how we translate that. So thinking about this translation, an important quote from a paper that I recommend reading about decolonizing global health is that aside from direct health impacts on marginalized communities, these one size fits all or our approach to the public health programs, if they're conducted in a way in which exclusionary colonialist patterns that center Euro Western knowledge systems have also shaped the language and response to the pandemic, which in turn can have adverse health consequences. So what happened? The programs we designed early on, what was very evident is that our access to or uptake of effective isolation via testing was lowest in our hardest hit neighborhoods in Toronto, in, in, uh, sorry, in Ontario, despite the distribution and time from symptom onset to isolation being similar. And what we've shown here is access to testing was lowest in more diverse neighborhoods in Ontario. On this curve, we've shown infection deciles. So these were how we um, how uh, um, we had categorized or um, stratified out neighborhoods in terms of hotspots and and non hotspots by ranking deciles based on infection risk. The hardest hit neighborhoods had the lowest rates of testing. And again, despite the time from symptom onset to isolation being similar, reflecting access to testing as one of the primary modes that lead to this. And then there was a lot of discussion around what about contact rates? Well, we didn't have great measures of contact rates, but we could look at mobility through other proxy measures, which also have their issues. And what we found was that lower income neighborhoods, people were able to decrease their mobility just almost as much as higher income. And this is shown for the greater Toronto area. And across Ontario, thinking again about those deciles, those infection deciles, where um, FSAs were categorized based on infection, um, uh, sorry, case uh, observed cases per capita, the hardest hit neighborhoods or these hotspots, well, they decrease their mobility perhaps even more than less affected neighborhoods using cell phone data once again as proxies for mobility, which tells us that if the public health messaging was getting out there, but there was still residual risks that were not being accounted for through our intervention. So some things probably had equal reach and as shown with testing, some things had unequal reach. Well, vaccine initially was one of those things that had unequal reach. This is the vaccine uptake by neighborhood infection death cells. Once again, shown what lowest rates of vaccination uptake. This is excluding individuals living in long-term care homes, lowest, coverage of vaccine in the neighborhoods that were hardest hit until the vaccine, uh, until the hotspot strategy was implemented, where in about a week and a half later, we see a reversal in vaccine coverage by infection death cells. 
So that was about public health programs, just a brief description. What about public health messaging? What happens when we translate our simplifying assumptions into public health messaging in a world with causal pathways that our models we haven't included, that we have not included in our models? Apologies for the typos. And if we reflect back, if we take a look at just our bivariate analysis, for example, and descriptive data analyses, and it can often lead to um, assumptions or interpretations that are stigmatizing for communities most affected. And one of the most, uh, what I thought was a very powerful um, opinion piece in the Toronto Star was written by um, three experts discussing underlying social and structural contexts within which we could start explaining why South Asian communities were experiencing higher rates of COVID. And a lot of this had to do with that overlap with respect to those social and structural determinants. In our analysis, what we found, and this is for wave one, if we take a look at unadjusted rates of COVID in the context of neighborhoods, more diverse neighborhoods had higher rates of COVID. But then when we adjusted for house, housing, household income, occupation, as well as demographics, so sex and age, that relationship or that pattern goes away, telling us something about what starts explaining why there were higher rates of COVID observed in neighborhoods that were more diverse. And this is nicely described in an important paper by Mugge Sevek and Stefan Burrell, where they describe this idea of taking a look at individuals who may fall into this case A and individuals who may fall into case B, but thinking about things in the context of networks. Some of us work from home and can self-isolate if needed very easily. Case B, however, may represent some of us who work in public facing jobs and or live in unsafe and or work in unsafe workplaces and or live in homes with multi-generational or large households. Our overall risks of exposures and onward transmission risks are different. Yet oftentimes our messaging is the same for both communities or people living or people working in both, in both uh, uh, different networks. And so here's some anecdotal examples that um, I had found instructive for me in thinking about how, um, what, what our messaging could be doing. So as modelers and epidemiologists, and here's, and some of these examples are also from us MDs, we, inter we do interpret the modeling and data and we contribute to the messaging, whether we're writing the papers or whether we're interpreting the papers and, and, and going on media or whether we're on social media. And most importantly, whether we're at the tables helping make decisions or informing decisions. I recall in the third wave peak, um, a colleague saying on media that I forgive those who got infected at work, but not others. And reflecting back on what we understand about stigma, which is not that it's not an effective tool in public health. And I'd like to share some work by Julia Marcus, who has worked on stigma for a long time, stigma in public health for a long time, and an important paper that in the Lancet that reviews why stigma is not an effective tool in public health and what its implications for in public health have been. Another important comment that had been made, not just in social media, not just in um, previous papers, but also in meeting discussions and um, has been framing individuals as vectors. And one of the uh, stark example of this was when a colleague had described long-term care workers as the vectors um, of infection. And this framing um, reflects on what um, Smith uh, um, um, an expert in stigma and public health and st um, stigma messaging has written about, in which stigmas are, that are, commu are communicated to and among community members to socialize them on how to recognize the stigmatized and to enact the required devaluation of them. And that's exactly kind of what we, what we did when we use terminology like individuals or subsets of the population uh, as vectors. And finally, and this was from um, just a few weeks ago, a discussion um, at meetings wherein it was said that it's no longer social inequalities anymore that are the risk factors for COVID-19. It is the proportion unvaccinated, which I think we can all pause on and think about what, what leads to 
um, vaccine mistrust and whether or not we can erase the social and structural inequalities from that equation. So stigmatizing terminology. It's been um, somewhat pervasive through this pandemic. It's been pervasive through previous um, epidemics and outbreaks. Um, and there's a lot to learn from the work um, of experts in HIV and communities um, living with and affected by HIV that have reshaped how we as researchers working in the field of HIV and other STIs um, have reframed how we do research as well as the language and the interpretation, the messaging of research, both in research design and um, con conduct of research, but also thinking about interpretation and messaging. And so a lot of that has to do with terminology and, and phrasing. And one of the key ones is in our writing that it's person first, it's a person with infection, person diagnosed with COVID-19, person living with HIV. And talking about the experience of risks and vulnerabilities, and I should add in here resilience, rather than um, a person who is um, um, a high risk person, for example. So that changes in that language. And then importantly, when we think about and talk about the context of what drives transmission, thinking about the context rather than a subset of the population or a person. And this was from guidelines from years ago, which have, uh, are being um, updated uh, recently, but also there are similar um, uh, framework, framing and guidelines and discussions from the US CDC, for example, in the context of respiratory viruses and COVID-19. And I'd like to posit that stigmatizing message and terminology is not about political correctness or, or trying to be a good person. Um, and, and I've often heard that from some colleagues who who say, well, can you tell me the political, politically correct way to say X or Y? It's actually not as much about that. It, um, it, it's thinking about the negative public health impact of that part of our science. And it, what it actually reflects is poor science because it demonstrates an absence of contextual validity. So I'd like to reflect on that when thinking about how we move forward. So for whom did we design the public health response to COVID? Well, we've seen the consequences. These are the excess deaths from wave one in Ontario. They're twice in the um, neighborhoods with the lowest income. This is excess deaths. And when we take a look at cumulative or adjusted marginal probability of COVID death and, and non-COVID death as a competing risk, Persons living in the lowest versus highest income neighborhoods in Ontario experienced two times higher chance of acquiring and dying with COVID. And this is in Ontario, once again, up until January. And while those were some of the consequences, there are benefits to thinking about heterogeneity and actually applying it within public health, informed even from simplistic or simple, not simplistic, simple modeling and fundamental insights. So you recall that we showed that vaccine, what happened to vaccination coverage by infection decile or by within hotspots and non-hotspots after the hotspot strategy was started for first dose. Well, we actually didn't, there was actually no policy change for second dose. That first dose prioritization strategy translated into ongoing benefits when thinking about coverage for second dose. And you recall that when we had looked at testing, testing rates were lowest in the hardest hit neighborhoods. But when we started the hotspot strategy, mobilizing vaccinations with strategies tailored to the hardest hit neighborhoods increased access to testing relative to other neighborhoods. Testing overall went down, but that relative difference went in the favor of the hardest hit neighborhoods. So the three principles of, in the practice of public health, equity, social justice, participation. I think what it behooves us to do as modelers, as epidemiologists, as scientists, is to check our privilege. And in case as modelers and epidemiologists, what we're really thinking also are about our decisions about our assumptions. And so as we clean and generate fundamental insights, because there is, incredible validity and importance of keeping things simple. What we must consider or what I would 
propose we consider is how we extrapolate our findings into public health messaging, because it requires nuanced and thoughtful consideration of the implications in the context of communities that the science serves. Under what conditions do our insights hold? How do we minimize misinterpretation? And what are our lived implicit biases that we bring to our interpretation? Second, terminology and language matters when modeling even implicitly the lived realities of communities. And I think we can draw on guidance from the literature and guidance from communities affected by various health conditions, and importantly, the structural and social factors that lead to disproportionate experience of those health conditions to frame our, to reframe our language. Third, the importance of partnering with communities most affected with questions and insights generated by communities. And this has to do with our research design. And I think this is something that Professor Osgood is gonna speak about next week more. But finally, it also means modeling led by communities. And therefore thinking about community engagement and reflecting on asset versus deficit models of community engagement. Asset models of community engagement is an approach that, that values the capacity, skills, knowledge, connections, and potential in a community versus a deficit model, which focuses on the needs of problems and efficiencies. Asset-based models build on a community's capacity to meet their own needs and its capacity to advocate for and leverage resources. And so what this really reflects is the how we do number three and number four. Community-led, community-based participatory research it also includes interpretation of analyses. And there is an extensive literature on guidance surrounding this. And the practice of it takes years, as well as long established and um, trust, um, meaningful uh, and trustful relationships. And part of this uh, was framed around the GIPA principle, the greater involvement of persons living with HIV and AIDS, when we do HIV research as an example. So what I'd like to ref, um, think about as the panel, as, the, uh, as Math for Public Health thinks to how this is going to be implemented into the network and, and the practice and our, the practice of our modeling. And first like to highlight the importance of amplifying and, there, and then working with resourcing, valuing, and learning from longstanding expertise in social and structural determinants of health and community expertise. As an important first step, amplifying the voices um, and the work of co our colleagues who've been doing this for many years um, is, an, is a really important and a first step. And so I'm just gonna close a bit on a soapbox, some anecdotal observation as an epidemiologist and modeler during the COVID-19 pandemic in Ontario. So this is where I'm gonna use the I part. I found it easier to get results of simple models, reduce contacts equals lockdown into relevant policies and, and to scientific leaders than data and modeling with heterogeneity, social and structural determinants into policies and practice for discussion. I did find that justice-based considerations of power imbalances and systemic disadvantage as described by Smith and Upshur and Al, um, in the context of policymakers, I found that it made scientists also uncomfortable. I found that the term equity was used a lot, especially after wave one, without due diligence nor details, mechanisms by which equity could be achieved or mechanisms by which to avoid further amplifying inequities. I found that scientists, many of us, we look at the same data, the same model, the same analyses, but we interpret the implications for public health programs very differently. And I wonder how much of that comes from our experience as well as our lived realities. And finally, I think there were too few scientists with academic expertise and or lived experience with social and structural inequalities who were invited to relevant leadership tables and supported in leadership positions. So for whom did therefore we um, design and implement the public health response to COVID? And to what extent did our public health response and messaging reinforce injustice? It was an important article 
um, that I'd recommend everyone read. Where Ed Young at the Atlantic wrote this really profound statement, I thought. The promise of biomedical panaceas is deeply ingrained in the US psyche, but COVID should have shown that medical magic bullets lose their power when deployed in a profoundly unequal society. There are other ways of thinking about preparedness and there are reasons those ways were lost. And that last part about those reasons that those ways were lost, I think is important to highlight because learning from SARS, equity and inequalities were front and center in their recommendations. So I think one of the things we're gonna to need to tackle is why it wasn't front and center when we came upon this our COVID pandemic, despite years and decades of guidelines telling us to. And as a network, as we're thinking about EDI and how this applies to our work, I'd like to reinforce an important paper that was um, describing that there's a distinction between workforce diversity from health equity efforts. So when we apply an equity lens to science, it's not the same as workforce equity, diversity, inclusion practices or principles. So caution with our checklists that we don't conflate the two, but instead leverage extensive data and literature on how inclusivity and meaningful diversity and representation in science and science leadership results in better science and better public health. So what the two are intertwined, but we have to be careful not to conflate them. And therefore, finally, asking ourselves who was, is at the table, informing, influencing, designing, and implementing the public health response to COVID, to public health emergencies, to emerging outbreaks and epidemics. And with that, I'm going to close by thanking all of our colleagues um, as part of our heterogeneity in COVID-19 research group, the scholars and community expertise across disciplines and the literature that we draw upon to do this work. And finally, the community-led programs and particularly the community ambassadors and everyone at the front lines delivering the services in response to the pandemic, and the people working on site in essential services and their households who shoulder the burden of the pandemic to enable the rest of us to shelter in place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Uh, for me, wow, what an ex educational experience. And uh, I might even uh, recall some of the terms that uh, I, I abused uh, to with uh, now I understand the consequence and uh, implication and really appreciate all this, uh, this, uh, this uh, wonderful uh, experience uh, and, uh, to share with us. Uh, any other questions, comments? I, I hear a lot of uh, applause uh, pouring now and also have some comments from Charles. Uh, you can raise your question directly to uh, Dr. Mishra. Yes, uh, Deirdre? Hi, I have a question. So uh, you, you talked about um, the importance of including the community and modeling. Could you talk a little bit about how you um, how you imagine doing that? Great. So, um, and I, I, if it's okay, I'm going to rephrase uh, a little bit what I probably would like to say is, which is, I'd like modelers to be included um, or invited to a community-led program design and evaluation. And I think how that's best achieved is um, if I draw upon examples from the field of HIV. So um, we. A lot of modelers consider themselves in the field of HIV to be um, embedded within the science of the programs. So often community leaders, community programs um, invite modelers to work with them to help answer the questions. And our experience with COVID for our team has been somewhat similar. So um, we were invited by community-based organizations to work with them to help think about the questions in a way in which models could perhaps answer them. And that often required or was involved adapting a simple model within the context of the local population structure and or really the contact structure. So examples of that um, were partnerships with um, uh, Toronto Public Health for the shelter system. 
So working with um, colleagues and communities working within the shelter system, um, as well as Chiefs of Ontario being invited to, to participate in um, engaging in technical work around the modeling. So, so I think there's two ways to go about that. One is that um, as a network opening ourselves up to the, um, and being on, um, opening ourselves up to um, uh, discussions with communities and community leaders um, and learning from the expertise of communities rather than consultation with communities. Um, and then I think that um, emblematic of the partnership will be as modelers being asked to work by communities with communities. Um, so um, system, systemizing that I think um, takes time and, and trust. Um, and I think what will help with a lot of that is the, the who is at the table part. So thinking about um, how a component of diversity and inclusion within our modeling network is built through, um, through capacity building um, that engages people with lived experience. So just, I would say concretely, think about our trainees. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Michael Watson. Watson. All right. Uh, just turning, clicking the buttons here. Um, two comments or, or, or questions, I guess. One is there, there's a phrase attributed to Einstein, keep it simple, but not too simple. So all your talk about heterogeneity is, strikes me as fundamentally important, but does that have implications in your mind for how simple or not so simple the mathematical models uh, need to be? And given what you were just saying, it seems to me there might be two routes there. One is to have a model that covers many neighborhoods or subpopulations, but is not too simple. The other is to have many models, one each for uh, each community or special population. So what do you think of that sort of fork in the road in terms of modeling strategy? And the other one, since I'm a longtime data junkie, uh, what have you missed most in terms of the available data? Um, so th th terrific questions. I think the first one is something that um, uh, I know that our team has uh, struggled with a lot um, in terms of thinking about um, the model specification. And I think what we've landed on, um, and this is in the context of both um, HIV modeling, STI modeling, and with COVID. So I think it comes down to that research question. So what are we going to use the model for? So there are, there's a path of fundamental insights. Uh, and there's been a great work around thinking, for example, there's a great paper on just heterogeneity and vaccine escape. Very simple model that just describes these fundamental insights. Um, and then there's thinking about the application of that work. And then probably the third layer is whether a model is being specified for a given community, is the question different? Or is it that the, the, the parameterization, the context, the data that go into the model different? Um, so I think it's sort of three parts. It's sort of the fundamental insights and the application of those fundamental insights to a diverse population. And then there's a models designed to answer a specific question within the context of a specific population or context. Um, I, I don't that there's um, one of our um, team members, Jesse Knight, is doing a lot of work on um, how much heterogeneity matters when, uh, depending on the research question. Um, and it's not as simple as probably saying, you know, there's a rule for this much heterogeneity for this particular research question, um, but rather sort of thinking it through with respect to um, uh, if it makes sense for that. I think the fourth part is actually about prediction and this is and forecasting. Um, and I think that's an open discussion that I don't have a solution for, but I would love for further discussion around because when, we, when we're forecasting what's going to happen within a particular geography, we, no matter what, we sort of subsume all of that heterogeneity. Um, and right now, I think what I've landed on is that forecasting is the interpretation that it matters the most as we work through the kinds of models um, that we need to develop for forecasting given heterogeneity. Um, so saying that there's going to be X number of ICU admissions 
in the next, you know, um, uh, 30 days. Recognizing that that number doesn't necessarily apply to all of us equally at the at the uh, in the in the population, um, and thinking about how we're going to message that. Yes, yeah, so there's fundamental questions about how we do the science of modeling <laughs> that, that I think we, we still need to tackle. The second, um, and, and, and hopefully what I've described is sort of how our team has, has taken that approach, which is just starting with the research question and going through as we would with a statistical model, model specification, justification, et cetera. The second question, I'm glad you asked that um, because that has been, um, we've dug as much as we could with the available data um, that, that, uh, that were there. And while it helped us um, uh, identify some of these important uh, social and structural factors, what was really missing um, was individual level data um, that, and, and household level data that could tell us about networks and how systemic factors affect individuals. Um, and I think that's quant quantitative data. The other part that I think was would have been great if we had more integration of social sciences um, and, and social and medical anthropology to help inform a lot of the um, quantitative data. So th those were the two um, parts that I, I would love there to be more of. Could you expand a second on the, this, this anthropological social science point? I, yeah. I assume you're referring to qualitative data, sort of how to interpret or think through. Yes, exactly. So I, I think, you know, we, um, it's easy to say that um, you know I'm going to use census data on the proportion visible minority living within a dissemination area as a proxy for systemic racism, um, but it belies a lot of the complexity of the pathways um, that that are in place. So having qualitative data to understand what does that mean in Toronto versus Sudbury would be helpful, even if I'm not I'm using it exactly the same way in, in our transmission model or our statistical model, the interpretation of that would, would be helpful. And it might actually change how we use it in our model. I might think about whether or not it's a effect modification versus if it's a confounder versus if it's the main exposure variable. So I, I think um, having that context, it, it's helped us with HIV work. I think it would have helped us a lot with, with COVID work as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a John, John Bob Popper raised hand. John, please. Yes, uh, interesting lecture uh, or seminar that you presented. I, I just wanted to uh, ask you about the mathematical modeling aspect of it. Uh, do you have a group working uh, beside you or with you within, let's say, a hospital setting that that is uh, very cognizant or very uh, ex somewhat uh, expert in, in the use of mathematical models that and they interact with, uh, let's say, the field institute, or do you directly uh, work with the field's uh, institute people when you do the mathematical modeling? Um, so I guess I'm a mathematical modeler. <laughs> so we, uh, um, I, I trained in mathematical modeling, so it's what myself and our research team do. Um, I'm based at the University of Toronto Department of Medicine. Um, I have a PhD in, in mathematical modeling, and uh, so it's what our team works on. I, I definitely collaborate with both my former PhD supervisor um, and other colleagues. Um, so I'm not quite sure I understand the, the question, perhaps. Maybe if you could clarify. I did not know that you had a PhD in mathematical modeling, so I, I, would, I would assume that you, you directly uh, relate to the people at fields because of your background in mathematical modeling. But I'm just, uh, so you basically answered the question. But the second question I have is, are these mathematical models available to the public? So from our team, um, when we have completed our mathematical models, we make our code open access. Um, the statistical analyses, as much as we're able to make the data that we have access to open access, we do. Um, there are various models that have captured heterogeneity that are, um, open access and, and available, yes. How can you, uh, sorry, I just wanted to, uh, to find out how they might be available. Like, um, is there a, like you, can, you can access to, uh, to yeah, take a look so, at them? So, yeah, so, so usually, um, so often the, the links to the papers um, and uh, are, are the way in which uh, um, one can access the model code, uh, which is sh uh, shared on GitHub. Um, 
and or just reaching out to us if I haven't had a chance to clean up the code um, or our team hasn't had a chance to clean up all of the code yet. Um, but uh, yes. Um, it's, 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 they're open access. I don't, we don't have a structure in which we've sort of shared things to a network, but I know that um, both Math for Public Health Network as well as CANMOT Network are setting up repositories to, to enable that uh, to be uh, widely disseminated. So if somebody could, uh, could could contact the Fields Institute, they might be able to get all this information then, is that correct? Um, yes, and I'm happy to work with Sarah in terms of how researchers are linking through that, but, but yes. And, and all of the links to our papers as well. I, I can put our lab website up. I didn't think to do that. Very interesting how you, how your the medical uh, background that you have relates to the to the mathematical background. That's a very uh, that's a very esoteric uh, uh, qualification that you have. Um, it might be in Canada, but it's actually not in many other parts of the world. So in the UK, um, so many um, when I trained, there were people from various different fields. Um, including um, coming from social sciences, um, medicine, and other fields, um, and in particular field epidemiology, because a lot of what we do um, is uh, generate line lists and you know and and estimate um, reproductive rate using um, established tools, and so um, have gone into mathematical modeling. So, um, and our, our team has a similar diversity in, in sort of who comes in and, and does uh, great mathematical epidemiology, particularly because our interest has been around centering it in the design and implementation of public health programs. Well, thank you. Thank you, John, for raising those uh, questions. I think uh, the public would also like to know answer those <laughs> questions. I just want to mention that uh, Dr. Mishra is one of the few people who has uh, both MD and PhD and uh, strong training and the leadership in mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. Uh, Phil is very proud that uh, Mishra has been a much sought after speaker to many of the activities, uh, including for example today. And uh, for that, I want to thank again, uh, Mr. for your support to the activities and uh, your participation uh, in the network. So uh, with that, I want to again thank you all of you for attending today's uh, special sessions. And we're looking forward to you uh, participating in next week's event and our follow-up panel discussions in January. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. It was excellent. Thank you. Bye.